everyone. This is David Mandel at OHEL Children's Home and Family Services, and welcome to OHEL's conversation this evening on reimagining happiness. I had the opportunity to speak with Professor Sanya Lubimirsky um, several weeks ago about her work, which I would consider profound work on happiness. We have spent so much time over the past couple of years dealing with life's most difficult challenges. At OHEL, in the thousands of individuals that we serve in New York City, Long Island, New Jersey, regionally, nationally, we like to say a fact that prior to COVID, one out of every three individuals that called us so that we served experienced anxiety, suffered from anxiety, experienced anxiety. Clearly, our data is very strong that shows that two out of the three people that we come into contact with in some way experience anxiety. And some suffer from anxiety in a very severe way. A conversation on happiness is an important conversation because in order to be able to get through life's most difficult challenges, we need some serenity. We need some equilibrium. We need some balance in life. And I was fascinated by Professor Sanya Lubimarsky, Lubimirsky's work in happiness. Professor Lubimirsky is at University of California. She has pioneered a detailed yet easy to follow plan to increase happiness in our day-to-day -day lives. Who would not want to increase our happiness in our day-to-day -day lives? Her groundbreaking work, The How of Happiness, is a comprehensive guide to understanding what is and isn't happiness. Dr. Lubimirsky offers a new and potentially life-changing way to understand our innate potential for joy, as well as our ability to create happiness in our lives and for our loved ones. Dr. Lubimirsky is going to discuss her work or research, what led her to the how of happiness, and then she and I will have a conversation specifically on the questions that individuals like yourself have asked us to pose to her. We also invite you to submit your questions on our chat, and we will get to as many questions as possible. Professor Libimirsky, it's a pleasure to introduce you. Welcome, good evening. Thank you so much, David, for that lovely introduction. I'm gonna start sharing my slides. And I hope everyone can see and hear me. Good evening, everyone. I'm so sorry about the poor air. Um, I'm in California, so I'm a little bit lighter where I am here. Um, I'm honored to speak tonight on a topic that's really near and dear to my heart, and that is how can we all become happier? How can we flourish? How can we become more resilient? Which is possible for everyone, but it's not easy. It's possible at any age in almost any situation, including during difficult challenges, but it's not easy. So today I'm gonna to talk about my research on happiness, which I started almost 35 years ago, back in the fall of 1989. So this work, I hope that you'll find relevant to your own lives, as well as to your friends and families. Um, so this is this book, The How of Happiness, is where much of the work is described. And here are my uh, collaborators and my students who have done the research with me. So I'm gonna to start today by taking a, a kind of a long step back, back to World War II. So during the Second World War, aviation experts used a lot of energy and resources to studying military planes that went down. And one day somebody asked, why don't we study the planes that stay up in the air? 
And I think that's an apt metaphor for the work that my students and colleagues and I do in this field, which we call well-being science. We study why happy people are happy, why healthy people are healthy, and why successful people are successful. Fortunately, a number of laboratories, including my own, have been sort of toiling hard to answer these questions. So today I'm gonna to give you a flavor of the different kinds of experiments that we've done in trying to understand how happiness can shift over time in all kinds of people and families and cultures. And I'm also gonna give you a conceptual model or theory that drives our research and gives a big picture. And I believe that most of us want to be happy, want to thrive, to flourish. Even if we don't use the same, the language, the same language to describe that wish, and if, even if we might define happiness differently, uh, indeed the desire for happiness, lots of surveys show, appears to be a universal or almost a universal or almost a near universal goal. I actually was born in Russia where people talked about the importance of suffering Suffering was important to build character or to gain salvation into the next life. Um, and even in Russia, when people asked, when I asked people, um, what do you want most for your children? They said, I want my children to be happy. So maybe it matters how you ask the question. Okay, so before I begin, I wanted to define the term happiness. So basically, um, along with many other researchers, I define happiness as consisting of two components. Um, and the sort of a cognitive and an emotional component. So basically the first, the first part of happiness is people who are happy tend to experience fairly frequent positive emotions like joy, interest, pride, enthusiasm, affection, peacefulness. Um, of course, not all the time, but you know, much of the time. Uh, but that's not enough. They also have a sense that they're achieving their life goals, that their life is good, that they're satisfied with their life. Notably, your life doesn't have to be perfect to believe that it's good. And so you can think about these two components of happiness as being happy in your life and being happy with your life. I should also add that hundreds of studies have now shown that people who report being happy in their lives and being happy with their lives are healthier, they live longer, they're more creative and more productive. Happier people tend to be better leaders and negotiators. They have more social support they have more fulfilling relationships and they're better able to bounce back from adversity to show greater resilience in the face of stress and trauma. So happiness is not just something that feels good. Some people feel selfish about pursuing happiness, but it's not just about feeling good. It has many benefits for ourselves and for our families and for our communities. So being happy leads people to accrue all kinds of good things in their lives. So just as one example, I wanna show you a few studies on physical health and happiness. Of course, we all care about physical health. And so these are all longitudinal studies that I'm going to show you. They measure happiness at a particular point in time, and then they follow people across time to see if they develop illnesses, if they get sick, to see how long they live. So these studies have shown, and every line is basically a different, a different study. So people who are happy at one point in time have a lower incidence of stroke 16 years later, lower incidence of heart disease 15 years later, if they have heart disease, they're more likely to survive it up to 11 years later. Happier people, if they have lung cancer, are more likely to survive it three years later. Happier people are less likely to be receiving work disability up to 11 years later. They're less likely to die in car accidents, which is an intriguing finding. And overall, happier people tend to live longer. Um, now, I wanted to mention a caveat is that this research does not intend to blame people who get sick. Health is, health is determined by many, many causes and one's happiness or well-being is only one of those many causes. So why is happiness good for health? Well, there are likely many reasons for that. So there's evidence, for example, that happy adults and children engage in better health behaviors like eating well, exercising, being cautious while driving, using seat belts. Positive emotions, which is, all, which is also a, a hallmark of happiness, tends to boost people's immune system. So when you experience more positive emotions, you tend to, um, have stronger immune functioning. So there are data uh, indicating that. So when I tell people what I do, um, I'm often asked, when I say that I study happiness, I'm often asked, is it even possible to become happier? And so I, I get this question so often, I even titled this talk after it. And so that's really kind of the major question that drives my research. Well, fortunately, tons of randomized controlled experiments Basically, randomized controlled experiments are like clinical trials. Everyone now knows 
you know, following like vaccine research, what a clinical trial is, if you didn't all know before. So basically what we do in our research is we, um, and we and others have shown that people can become happier when they deliberately and sort of intentionally practice what we call various positive activities, activities like expressing gratitude, savoring the good things in our days, and doing acts of kindness. And, and I'm going to tell you about some of these studies today, but today I'm going to focus on um, uh, research that shows that doing kind, grateful, and social acts, being more generous, being more grateful, and being more social, how that makes people happier, makes people flourish more, and makes people feel more connected. So in my lab and other labs, we've been testing the conditions under which these kinds of activities that I wrote there are most successful at making people happy. Now, if you're interested in the conversation after the talk, I'm also interested in the conditions under which sometimes the pursuit of happiness can backfire and might actually make people less happy, sort of undermine happiness. So we can talk about both the, the light and the dark side of the pursuit of happiness if you're interested. So my laboratory conducts what we call positive activity interventions. So what we typically do in our studies is we instruct our participants to practice a particular activity like, like write gratitude letters on a regular basis, say for two weeks or four weeks or two months or three months. And then we follow them across time to see if that exercise makes them happier over time. And then of course, we also include various relevant control groups or comparison groups. But I'm primarily interested not in which activities work to boost happiness, but in sort of how they and why they work. Sort of the how and the why question is what interests me the most. And so my, the book that sort of describes a lot of this research, that's one reason it's called The How of Happiness. Um, okay, so to give you the big picture, I'm gonna give you, and sort of bear with me for a moment, I'm gonna give you the model or sort of the theoretical framework that drives my research and essentially illustrates which factors uh, impact the effectiveness of, the, of any activity. So for example, the idea is you engage in a positive activity, like you savor, you meditate, you exercise, and that makes you happier, presumably. So why does that happen? Because of more positive, maybe in, in, you engage in more positive behaviors or positive thoughts. That's the why part. And then how does it happen? This is the how part. So uh, what are features of the, of the happiness seeker? How motivated you are, what your culture is, and the, and the happiness activity itself, what its dosage is, what its target is. And so basically, um, this is the how, and this is the why of the model. And so basically the questions that we ask are, how, as an example, how and why is it when people express gratitude, they become happier? So I'm going to refer to this figure throughout my talk, and so hopefully you'll get a sense of what I mean by it. So jumping right into the research, I'm going to start with a, with a study that we did, one of our first happiness interventions that we have ever done, where we asked people to count their blessings as a way to try to increase happiness. So here we had volunteers write down every week up to five things that they're grateful for, and so I you probably all know what that means to count your blessings. And furthermore, we ask people to do this either once a week, so every Sunday night, count your blessings, or three times a week, every Tuesday, Thursday, and Sunday night. And people did this over the course of six weeks. Uh, and we also had a control group. So this, and so let me show you what we found. So I'm gonna show you graphs that show uh, changes in gratitude and changes in happiness from before to after this intervention, the six week, basically six week trial. Um, and so interestingly, what we found is that only in the group that counted, the, counted their blessings once a week, did, we, did they show increases in gratitude, significant increases in gratitude, and also significant increases in happiness. The control participants and the participants who counted their blessings three times a week did not become more grateful and did not get become happier. So we were a little bit surprised about that at first, but basically we believe what we found was that it's really important to consider the right or optimal dosage of gratitude when you want to try to become happier. So may, maybe counting your blessings three times a week became a chore. Maybe it wasn't so meaningful. In fact, a lot of people tell me after I give talks on this, they'll say, maybe it's not an accident that a lot of religious uh, um, rituals are once a week. Maybe there's something about reviewing your life once a week um, may, is, is sort of special. So here's a study that showed the importance of considering dosage. I have dosage there circled when you're trying to sort of develop the optimal sort of strategy for pursuing happiness. Okay, moving on. We've also done lots of studies where we ask people 
to do acts of kindness. Um, obviously, there's lots of reasons we help others, mostly because that's what we want to do. It's the right thing to do. We want other people to be happier or less distressed or help them with whatever they need help for, but also helping others helps ourselves, right? So it, it makes us happier. So we've done a number of studies where we ask people to do acts of kindness. So in this um, particular example, we did a study where we asked people to do for six weeks to either do five kind acts all on one day. So like for the next six weeks, every Monday, do five acts of kindness that you don't normally do, or we ask people to spread their five acts of kindness on uh, uh, any time they want during the week, or we had a control group. Um, here are examples of the kind, the kinds of kind acts that people did in that particular study. Um, they could be from little things like opening the door to someone for someone, to like donating blood or um, uh, helping out in the classroom. Um, and here's what we found. So again, these are changes in happiness from before to after the six week intervention. And interestingly here, we found that um, people, only people, oops, I circled the wrong group, only people who did acts of kindness on a single day, um, they actually became happier. The other groups did not become happier. So there's something about doing acts of kindness all in one day that makes it really salient, that makes it really powerful. So again, this study indicated to us that it's important to consider um, or pay attention to the dosage of a positive activity. One of many factors that's important to consider when you try to craft the optimal well being intervention or the most successful happiness. Uh, okay, so um, here's a, now I'm gonna show you another example of a kindness study we did. And so here um, it's, an, it's an example of something to consider when you're trying to maximize the success of a happiness strategy, and that is whether the strategy is directing attention onto yourself or onto other people. So this, is, this was a study that we did with a diverse sample of participants, and it was a four-week intervention with a two-week follow-up. And we found that it's critical that people focus on other people. So let me show you. We had four conditions, and one we asked people uh, every week for the next month, we want you to do three acts of kindness for other people that you don't normally do. So it might be taking out the trash in your household if you don't normally take out the trash. It might be bringing a cup of coffee to your colleague. Or we had a comparison. We asked people to do three kind acts for the world. And that could be like picking up litter or doing something nice for the environment. Or we asked people to do three acts of kindness for themselves. Now, this was a really nice comparison condition because this is kind of like self-care or doing something self-indulgent, uh, eat a piece of chocolate, take a nap, get a massage, do something sort of nice for yourself which we thought would make people feel happy at least uh, temporarily. And then we had a control condition where people, we, where people asked, were asked to organize their time by helping sort of keep track of their activities. So in this study, we were looking at, again, happiness or flourishing across time. So now this is a line graph, uh, and this goes across the four-week intervention and the follow-up. So you see here that uh, the blue line represents people who did acts of kindness for others of the world, so they got happier after the inter throughout the intervention, and even through the two-week follow-up, they stayed happier, but people in the control group or those who did acts of kindness for themselves did not actually sort of maintain or increase their happiness uh, over the course of the study or through the follow-up. Through the follow -up. So um, this study demonstrates that ironically, if you want to make yourself happier, you need to direct your attention to other people. You need to sort of make someone else happier. Um, and again, getting back to the model that I showed, it's important to pay attention to whether whatever you're doing to try to be happier, is it something that's directing attention to yourself or onto others? And sort of a general, a general kind of finding from research is that when you have, when your attention is too much directed to yourself, that sometimes can be toxic, right? It can, it can be, it can make you even more unhappy. Um, okay. So now moving on, I want to talk about uh, research that we've done where we ask people not to help others, but to just be more social. And so it's interesting. It's so easy just to sort of, you know, say hi to the barista or call up a friend just for a few minutes. Um, being social doesn't have to be being the life of the party. And so we started doing research a number of years ago um, because we're because I become interested in the finding that really it's social connection that seems to be the key to happiness and to the key to the pursuit of happiness. So in this study, which we did with over 500 working adults, we asked them over the course of a month again to engage in 12 more social interactions over the course of the month. So again, so these social interactions 
could be almost anything that involves sort of socializing with someone else, or we compared it to people who engage in 12 more kind or pro-social interactions. And in this study, we found that two important factors that influenced whether our participants were able to sort of connect and benefit from these kind or social interactions was whether it was with whom they interacted with and how and they interacted with them. And so we asked people like, when you got the cup of coffee for your colleague or when you talked to the barista or when you called up your old friend, um, how did you feel? Did you feel a sense of warmth with them? Did you feel a sense of mutual trust? Did you feel in sync with them? That's our measure of connection. And so in this study, we found that the medium mattered. Okay, so this is the, this is the intensity of connection that people felt when they were either trying to help someone or trying to interact socially with people in their lives. And we found, not surprisingly, that if you try to connect or help or, or someone or connect in person or by video chat or by phone, people reported a greater sense of connection than through texting, social media, et cetera. I should note that I have a whole line of research in my lab that I'm happy to discuss if you're interested that is sort of looking at the question of how technology and particularly smartphone use and screen use can affect well-being. Just like summarizing a lot, a lot of research, there's a particular group of a particular population that appears to be harmed by social media and by screen time use, um, whereas other populations aren't. And you may guess what that population is. And they are they're girls and they're young girls, basically tween and teenage girls tend to be harmed by, by sort of these virtual um, smartphone use and interactions, as opposed to boys who tend to use, um, use their smartphones uh, and their computers for gaming, which is social. And anything social is sort of tends to help or at least not harm. Um, okay, so basically when you're interacting by phone, video chat in person, that makes people feel more connected and makes people happier. And so just to sort of summarize this, what those three things have in common is that there's visual and voice contact. Basically, the more visual and voice contact there was, the more connected people felt and uh, the happier they were. So the medium mattered. And the other finding from that study is that it mattered who you interacted with, who did you help, who did you uh, talk to. Um, and not surprisingly, what we found was the closer the target was to you, if it's your partner, whether as opposed to a family member, friend, coworker, stranger, you felt more connected, more in sync, more warmth, more trust. Um, and so basically um, uh, uh, socializing and helping people who are really close to you makes people even more connected, even happier. I should note that it's there's research that shows that connecting with people or even strangers or neighbors also makes people happy, just sort of not as much if they're as, as if they're close to you. Okay. Um, Professor Sonia, yes. Professor Levimarski, I'm sorry to interrupt you. You, you are sharing so much information each slide has such a story to tell. I just want to interrupt you for a moment. Every single day on the last slide that you just showed, the last two slides, that every single come today we're having conversation about the value of remote work, hybrid work, in-person work, and everyone has their opinions about it depending on you know, what they see and the demands that companies are making to ask people to return to work, the value of in-person versus hybrid versus remote. Without commenting on that, the slide that you, that you have on the screen right now that says, without looking at the 67% versus the 77%, the pink versus the purple, it comments on itself. You say that speaking to people on the phone or a video chat or an in-person conversation has a higher level of satisfaction, interaction, happiness, finish the sentence any way you want, then by social media, by website or email or text message, and not commenting on teenage girls or teenage boys or six people that sit in a restaurant and all are sitting on their phones, not talking to each other. This is counterintuitive. Today, everyone thinks that just texting is a conversation. Tell us why people responded that speaking to people 
and watching people on a video chat or speaking to in person is really much more satisfying than the other four mediums that you described. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And I, and I and I was assuming that we'd get questions about this actually after the talk, because it is something that I always get asked about. Um, and so one of my answers is that human beings are hardwired to connect face to face and in person, right? We weren't, uh, we didn't evolve to connect with a device. Um, now devices have their function, right? Many of us are able to say, be part of a support group uh, across like states and countries. We are able to be in touch with our family members who are far away. So um, I don't want to say that they're not useful. They're absolutely useful for connection, but just like a little bit less useful than that face-to-face -face contact. Um, I, I actually thought about this a lot during COVID, right? Because we all had to like use Zoom all of a sudden. There's something about breathing the same air that is really special, right? Something that we're not doing right now in this in this webinar. Um, in fact, one, I have a colleague, I'm a professor, I have a colleague who's a professor of theater, and I was talking to her about it one day, and she said, you know, when you speak, uh, your voice sends vibration through your bones, and we don't even realize this, and so, so there's something that we are missing when we're not actually in person that we don't even realize, right, because we don't sense those vibrations, so just another one another sort of add to the list of why that face-to-face -face contact is so special but there's also something about voice that's also very special those three those three items on the on the graph here what they share is they all have voice and sometimes phone is actually even better than video chat there's something about the voice there again we're hardwired to listen and hear people's voices i just want to stay with that comment for a second because a minute ago you said and i see it very directly connected to this you know, there are very many, there are many ways to make ourselves happy. And I want to get to that in a few minutes, how we can make ourselves happy. But you said two or three minutes ago that if you want to be happier, make other people happier. And speaking to people and the vibrations that you hear from the phone, the video chat, the in-person, whatever it is, that is making other people happier. Just speaking to another person could make the other person happier and therefore makes you happier. Absolutely, absolutely. Can I just tell you about one more study we did that was so surprising where people were asked to have a 25 minute conversation on Zoom with a stranger. Okay, everyone think about this. Would you wanna have tomorrow a 25 minute conversation on Zoom with a stranger? Most people say, Oh, not really. I would rather do something else. I'm actually a huge extrovert. And even I, I'm like, oh, I don't really want to talk to a stranger. It was, we had the biggest happiness effect that we've ever seen in any study that we've ever done in terms of the average boost in happiness that people got after talking to a stranger. This was on Zoom, which is not ideal, but that was sort of the easiest way to do the study. So yes, absolutely. Talking to someone, even a stranger, makes us happy. Um, David, I'm just going to finish. I'm almost done. I'm just like- Go ahead, please. Done. I'm sorry to interrupt. Yeah, yeah, no, no, it's okay. I just want to show you one more study and, that, and then I'm done. Because the, the last study is kind of cool because it has to do with our, uh, genetic, our, our RNA gene expression. Okay, also kindness, how kindness actually can affect your immune system. So, so in recent years, we've become more interested in whether positive activities like gratitude or kindness can make people more than just happy. So for example, doing acts of kindness can have benefits beyond happiness. So I want to tell you about an exciting study that we did with a colleague at UCLA, and it had the exact same design that I've already showed. Okay, so we had four groups, keep track of your daily activities, organize your time, or do acts of kindness for the world, do acts of kindness for others, or do acts of kindness for yourself. But in this study, the, 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 the clincher was we collected blood before and after People did acts of kindness over the course of four weeks. And we analyzed, I'm not actually a biologist, but my, my colleague did this. He assayed that those that blood, the leukocytes, the immune cells in the blood to look at RNA gene expression. And here's what we found. So you don't really have to worry about what this means, but basically what we found was that only in the group that did acts of kindness for other people, they showed downregulation of pro-inflammatory genes that is less pro-inflammatory gene expression and think more inflammation is bad. So basically they're, they're um, doing acts of kindness led to changes in their, in their gene expression profile 
that was associated with sort of stronger immune system. And in another study, we replicated this. We also showed more antiviral gene expression. So it's too soon to say that if you want to ward off viruses, you should sort of help other people. But it's a really nice study that we've replicated. OK, so I'm going to sort of conclude the talk on what might sound like a cliche, OK? But as it, hopefully, you'll see that I've landed on this cliche after many years of research. I've only showed you a few studies I've done. Uh, dozens and dozens of studies. And the conclusion is that if you want to be happier and you want to thrive, if you want to experience the benefits of happiness, such as greater resilience, better health, better relationships, both during fraud and traumatic times and during sort of the normal ups and downs of life, research suggests that it's best to focus not on yourself, but on others, as David said, both on supporting other people and also recognizing the way in which they have supported you. Uh, so thank you very much. I'm ready for questions. We're speaking this evening on the OHEL webinar on reimagining happiness with Professor Sanya Lubimirsky, professor at University of California, who has authored many studies and a book on the how of happiness. We're speaking about happiness this evening. It's a good conversation on happiness. And you've shared... Um, so much information. I also want to acknowledge, in addition to my colleagues at OHEL, I want to acknowledge SPH, Community Service Network, UGA Federation of New York, and Prisma Center for Jewish Day Schools, who are co-sponsoring with OHEL and the OHEL helpline, the school helpline, this evening. Sonia, I've got about 20 questions. So let's see how many we can get through. These are questions that people have submitted based on this evening's conversation and based on what you said. I'd like to start with maybe a complex question. Now, there are so many people that are experiencing and suffering from cancer. And suffering from cancer, it's like three words that we can't even begin to describe any one of us, every one of us knows someone in our family, friends, community who's gone through that experience. But you said in relation to happiness, and I want to try to smile with my question on cancer. You said people who have cancer and are happy live on average three years longer. Could you explain that, please? Yes, uh, and actually the, the finding was that you're more likely to be to survive, you're more likely to still be alive uh, if you have lung cancer, which is a particularly deadly cancer. Uh, if you're happier, you're more likely to still be alive three years later than if you're less happy. And I, and I asked, added the caveat, uh, this is a very tricky thing to talk about um, because these researchers who do these, this work, they don't want to blame people who have cancer and that, oh, if you're... If you're getting sicker, that means that you're not happy enough. And if only you were happier, you would be healthier. There are many, many, many determinants and influences on health and well-being is one of them. And also it's a correlation. So it could be that happier people, maybe they're happier to begin with because there's something that they're sensing about their, their health or their life situation or their resources or the healthcare they're getting that's more positive. So it's a correlational finding. That's all really I can tell you. I'm, I'm not suggesting, oh, if you're sick, you should just try to be happy and you'll live longer. I want to make sure that's not misinterpreted. Professor, I read often mm -hmm. in the business world and technology world that over many years, people who worked at, you know, they have all these top 10 companies mm -hmm. and the top 10 satisfactory and happiness and things like that. Hewlett mm -hmm. Packard, the 100-year-old technology company has ranked in the top, if not number one, amongst the top companies that people have expressed an interest in working for because they're the most satisfied. They're the happiest people working at a company like Hewlett Packard. What makes a person happy? And they've also found that salary was not necessarily the number one factor that made people happy. It was relationships, social connections at work, being part of a team, 
feeling that you are heard. What's your reaction to that? Exactly, exactly. So I actually have been uh, consulting a little bit with a company Indeed that have, you know, many of you are familiar with that they have access to many, many, many workers that go on their website, millions of workers. And so they've been measuring some of these variables across many, many companies. And they're basically finding the same thing that you just said exactly, that it's not, I mean, certainly salary, work hours, you know, they play a role. So we don't want to say that doesn't matter at all. Um, but what really matters is having um, a sense of belonging, which I think is kind of partly what you're trying to get to, that you belong at work, um, the, the social connection at work, uh, the sense of autonomy or control that you have of, of your work, the sort of respect that you get at, at, at your job. So, so I basically just, the research is basically completely uh, supported, supportive of what you just said. There's a lot of conversation. This weekend journal had a lengthy article on remote work and hybrid work. And there's a lot of conversation, even controversy around that issue. Is it too early? Do you have any research? Are you familiar with research on happiness in relation to hybrid work, remote work, working remote full time? There's a happiness factor or there's a social isolation factor. What is going on these days in that conversation? Sure, sure, sure. I know a little, a little bit about the research, but obviously a lot more needs to be done because we need to look at long term. Um, the bigger, the biggest study I've seen so far, uh, people seem to be happiest or kind of prefer a hybrid format, right? So like a two, two to three days a, a week at work. So you get the best of both worlds, right? You do get some more autonomy control of your time when you're at home or being able to be with your children and have some balance. But then you also have the structure and the social connection face-to-face -face at work. So that seems to be, if I had to like conclude in like one sentence, that's what I would conclude, that hybrid seems to be uh, the answer. But all of the factors that you mentioned um, uh, play an important role. And uh, we, need, we need to sort of look at these factors over time because it just hasn't been long enough. So it's not surprising. It's the middle road, Sonia. It's not either extreme, it's the middle road, which is life in general. Yeah, yeah okay. I'm, a big proponent, I'm a big proponent of Aristotle's golden mean, right? Everything in moderation. Everything in moderation. Let's change direction for a moment and let's talk about loss because OHEL does a lot of work in the space of trauma and loss. Um, social media, speaking of hybrid work and remote work, mm -hmm. social media, one of the questions that we were asked, social media can contribute mm -hmm. to loneliness of companionship. Mm -hmm. How can I be happy if much of my relationship is on social media? Mm -hmm. Um Oh, big, big question. Uh, you know, the Surgeon General just came up with a report about how loneliness is a, an epidemic in the U.S. Um, and what we can do to change it. Most of his suggestions were sort of structural, right? Um, like how to build neighborhoods or organizations that foster the sort of reduce loneliness. But in terms of the role of, uh, of, of, um, of social media, um, there's some studies that show that what matters is how you use the social media, right? So if you use it in an active way, like if you're sort of passively scrolling, it can hurt your self-esteem. It can make you feel disconnected. It gives you a sense of FOMO, right? Missing out that other people are happy than you're not. Um, so um, I, I think, you know, I, I, I guess I would say, let's not focus so much on social media because you know, we have technology, I just call it sort of digital media. We have so much technology that can help us uh, connect and reduce loneliness, but it doesn't have to be social media and certain, certain kinds of social media tend to be better than other kinds. And for example, I mentioned gaming. Some people might think it's, uh, it's frivolous to sort of play games. I'm not a gamer, but it turns out that can really make people feel connected when they're sort of playing a game with people, whether it's next door or somewhere else. Um, and so there's different kinds of connecting, even texting is better than social media. Um, but I mean, the bottom line is sort of actual like face-to-face -face connections are, are really important, but some people maybe can't have them. If you live in an area, maybe you live in a rural area where you just don't have a lot of face-to-face uh, -face connections. There's also AI is really coming and everyone's talking about it. We need to talk about it. It's a huge revolution uh, that's happening right now. There's a lot of worry that people are gonna be 
become attached to, you know, AI bots, right? Even worse than someone on social media who's actually a real human. So, so we need to we need to really think about these questions right now before the world changes on us. You know, um, Sonia, you know, Professor, I worry about individuals who are lonely, mm -hmm. who are alone, mm -hmm. who are start, who are going to be talking to um, AI, mm -hmm. who are going to be having a conversation um, on the chat mm -hmm. with a box, literally, whatever you want to call them. And very soon, you and I know that each one of them are going to have a name, that they're not AI, they're going to have a name. You know, Jim or Nancy or whatever name you want to give them, they're not going to be AI, they're going to be like a human intelligent person and it's going to be even more worrisome. Mm -hmm. Professor, let's talk about people who unfortunately experienced a loss, a change in life. They've lost a child. They've lost a family member. Um, or they are in a high conflict relationship. They're in an abusive relationship. They're in a high conflict divorce. Your research shows that to the extent that people can have an equilibrium a balance of happiness, obviously their life can be more stable, so to speak, it's a generalization. How can people who are experienced the loss or, or in a current high conflict situation or a post high conflict situation find happiness? That's a hard question. Um, I think it depends when you, if you're right in the middle of the, the traumatic or stressful event, or if you're, or if it's in the in the in the rearview mirror, so to speak, um, um, you know, there there's many ways that you can think about this question. Um, one way is through the lens of gratitude and thinking about you've had a loss and thinking about what you know what you do have in your life as opposed to what you've lost. And I, I know that sounds um, it sounds like you're trivializing it, so I'm really thinking about maybe when time has passed, I'm not, not right after. I myself, I think every, probably everyone listening today has had trauma or loss in their lives. I had um, a really, really horrible childhood adolescence, very traumatic. And when I went to college, I was so happy. I was so happy to have left that traumatic family situation um, and so grateful that I sort of escaped it. And so that was one way of, of finding happiness is, is being, grateful that it was over. Um, for something that's continuing is incredibly difficult. Uh, in one of my books, I talk about um, a woman who is caring for her mother. Her mother is dying a really horrible death. And not only is she dealing with that, but she's dealing with the financial, the bills. Um, and so she's not happy uh, except for, you know, one time a day where she's able to go outside and enjoy herself and sort of forget about the rest of her life. And so sometimes it's, it's possible to somehow distract and distract your attention from that, just to sort of enjoy life just for 45 minutes. And that could kind of nourish you. So I'm not, I should say, I'm not an expert on loss and grief. Um, all I can really say is sort of how, how one can use some of these strategies that I talk about that can lighten your load a little bit. Um, so yeah, so anyway, I can try, but uh, I might be the wrong person to answer those questions. I think you've answered the question brilliantly because you just said, and you reflected a personal situation in which you said, finding happiness is grateful that it's over. You don't necessarily have to find happiness. You have to accept that you've gone into the next stage whatever it is, and you found happiness that that phase was over. And you can move, I don't like to say moving on because what is moving on? We don't know what moving on is. You know, people say to other people who experience the loss, why don't you move on? What are you talking about moving on? I can't move on from loss. 
but that part is over. In the Jewish tradition, you sit shiva for seven days, and then you you sit, and then you literally stand up, and you literally start walking again. Professor, it doesn't mean that you're happy, but you literally stand up and you start walking again. That phase is over and you go to the next stage. We have a couple of other questions. Can you talk about being happy internally versus externally? If people are happy internally, does it mean that they have to smile and show the world that they're happy? Or are they okay being just happy internally? Yeah, not at all. Uh, when I talk about happiness, I talk about internal happiness. Um, people think that if happy means jumping for joy and smiling, smiley faces and rainbows and kittens. But many happy people, you won't, they don't necessarily look happy. They might just be very feeling very tranquil, tranquil uh, and satisfied with their lives. Or maybe they're really engaged and in flow with what they're doing. Maybe it's their work or it's their hobbies or spending time with their grandchildren. Um, so yeah, absolutely. It's the internal happiness that matters. Anxiety versus happiness. We talk about that so many people have anxiety today. There's so many studies that they're talking about the fact that children in public schools, they lost a year of social interaction and play dates and overnight visits and that this generation of two and three and four and five-year-olds have lost an entire year of relationships. Is it possible to have anxiety at the same time be happy? Are they contradictory terms? Or can I be anxious and be happy at the same time? Are they two different feelings? They are two different feelings. You could be both, but not exactly literally at the same time but maybe the same day or the same week or the same month. Um, so we could we could have negative and positive emotions that coexist. So maybe in the morning I'm anxious, but in the afternoon I'm happy. I mentioned the woman who, um, she, she her mom is dying, but she can go to the farmer's market and she's really happy while she's at the farmer's market and she's not anxious. And then she comes home and she's anxious again, uh, but that's still okay. Um, um, so yes, you could you could do both. So do one thing every single day that can make you happy. You mentioned earlier a gratitude letter. What does that mean? Yes, uh, I saw that question. Um, so gratitude letters are basically, they can, be a, they can be an email, they can be a text, they can be an actual handwritten letter. It doesn't have to actually be shared. Uh, it's uh, basically like a letter you write to someone in your life to whom you're grateful for, maybe someone who supported you, been kind to you, that maybe, you, maybe that person is no longer alive, uh, maybe you don't even know that person. Um, it could be someone in a popular culture who like really helped you. Um, and you write about why you're grateful and what it is that they've done that, that makes you that makes you grateful. And it, uh, lots of research shows that simply the act of thinking about and writing that letter uh, makes people feel more connected, more inspired and, and happier. I have a few more questions. This conversation to me is fascinating. We deal, we spend so much time dealing with uh, loss and grief and bereavement and trauma. I mean, I want to talk about happiness. We have uh, the work, the space that we're in at OHEL is dealing in high conflict situations. I like to say that in all my years at OHEL, we deal with thousands of people on a daily basis. I've never once had a phone call from anyone that said, Mandel, I'm happy. I don't need OHEL. My life is good. Anyone that calls has a situation, has a problem, whatever it is. So, you know, we have many calls from individuals who experience a lot of unhappiness in life with their adolescent children. High conflict situations, a positional defiant disorder, uh, addiction, alcohol, gambling, just you know, life's most difficult challenges. Can I as a parent be happy? A question was asked, how do I achieve happiness if my daily life is dealing with my adolescent child who is just going through torment and tormenting me? 
Okay. Oh my God. Um, you know the saying, a Jewish mother is only as happy as her least happy child? Uh, and of course, it applies to fathers and uh, non-Jewish people too. Um, and I, that's a hard one. You know, I have four, I have four kids myself, so I know what I'm talking about. Um, it's really hard to be happy if one of your children is not happy or is not doing well. So I, I don't, I don't even know how to answer that question. I think that's that might be the hardest question you've asked today. Uh, I guess I would, I would reiterate, you can still find connection. You can have a wonderful time talking to your best friend or your mother or, or your therapist um, or do, doing something, taking time out of your day. They can sort of give you a little bit of a break from that horrible situation that can, that can refresh you and revitalize and re-nourish you. But otherwise, that's a really hard one. Now, I want to ask you for some personal advice in front of a very large audience. I'm going to make believe that there's no one listening. Mm -hmm. It's just you and I speaking alone. Mm -hmm. um, I speak to a lot of people who are unhappy. Mm -hmm. They're unhappy in life. Mm -hmm. They're going through situations, high conflict, divorce, abuse, molestation, mental illness with children themselves, OCD, anxiety. You know, pick pick the conversation, fill in the blank. That's the work that we do at OHO. And you do an incredible amount of research. I was fascinated by your blues and your yellows and your purples and your greens, the conversation that you shared with us. I'm a very big believer. I'm asking you now for professional advice mm -hmm. for myself. I'm a very big believer that in the darkest days, in the most difficult days, if you can find your equilibrium, if you can find your balance, if you can find something in your core, in your gut, the one thing that can give you some satisfaction, whatever it may be, whether it's walking, jogging, writing, Talking to a very close friend, I'm not talking drugs or alcohol or gambling or anything like that, but finding one thing that gives you balance. It may be a picture of your favorite, whatever it may be, you know? Am I overstating it, Sonia, or is it something that's reasonable? Not not at all. And I, I, I think you, you said it more eloquently that I've been trying to say take time out of your day to do something that gives you that, I called it a break or a positive emotion, you call it balance, which I think is a very nice way to put it, that we all can find something that could give us that little break that can kind of like unclick that, that darkness. Um, and it'll make, it'll make it easier for us to come back and cope with whatever we're with coping. So um, yes, thank you for putting it that way. I think that you're absolutely right. The research supports it. Professor Levimoski, I love this conversation. Is there anything else that you share, want to share with us? Your future, your future research, what you see coming up in the next couple of months or a year that will change this conversation completely. And then you'll say, forget everything that I said in the OHO webinar. This is what happiness is. Yeah. Well, I think my last thing that I would say is, is kind of no, not, nothing that's going to change anything completely that the key to happiness is connection, social connection, usually connection with another person, although it could be with a pet, it could be with God, it could be with something, some cause larger than yourself. Um, but also that for everyone it's different. So it's kind of like what you're just saying, for every person that key is different. So if you see a book that says, you need to do X to be happy or to be resilient, I, I wouldn't trust that because for every person, it's a, this, they have their own different secret. You know, I love what you just said because it was such a contrast. Mm -hmm. You said it could be with God. Yeah. It could be with the pet. But if you see a book that says, this is your path to happiness guaranteed, <laughs> it's not. Yeah. Don't believe it. You have to find your own path to happiness. Professor Sanya Lubimarski, we encourage everyone to look at your work, The How of Happiness, we spend so much time 
life is so complex, life is so difficult. Take a moment to see how you can be happiness. It's not as difficult as you may think that it is. Find that one thing that gives you balance. I love this conversation. Thank you so much for joining us. Everyone this evening, please take a moment. When you have, when we send you the evaluation, take literally two minutes to tell us what you thought about this conversation and what you would like us to do additionally in the future. We look forward to having you again in the future. Thank you, everyone. Have a great evening. Good night. Thank you. Thank you.